Thank you, Travis. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming. Just to uh, correct uh, Travis a little bit, it was not just me last last year. It was also uh, uh, Ulrich Novak, the enterprise architect of Adidas. We had a talk together. But today we are going to talk about the popular topic these days, REST and GraphQL, and this will be a critical review. So my name is Zdeněk, uh, I'm also known as Z, and I help uh, companies to build APIs. I have uh, been at the start of the company, or almost from the start of the, of the company called APRA, which has been acquired by Oracle some two years ago, and we had the, the pleasure to work with many amazing clients, big and small ones. I left the APRA to start my own uh, consulting company called Good API, uh, because I've seen the opportunity to help people with their API journey, not just selling them the software, but really be uh, there with them and uh, work with them to, to make their API program success. And uh, I was super lucky to have uh, really interesting uh, uh, customers and uh, people working with so far. Um, I'm also the author of uh, uh, Supermodel IO, uh, which is a data modeling tool, which is for uh, modeling data for APIs. Uh, and not only APIs, it works really well with the GraphQL and REST, uh, which is the topic today. So, popular topic. I'm not going to discuss what REST or GraphQL is. It's not all that important what these things are in nuance. However, uh, I'm going to make few things clear here, and that one is architectural style, that is the REST. The other is a language and framework. Both can be used to build uh, distributed systems, to build the services and APIs for distributed systems. So I think of these, although they are sli slightly different things, as API paradigms. Um, and for the purpose of this review, I'll be thinking about the both REST and GraphQL as an implementation on top of HTTP protocol, because both REST and GraphQL can be, in theory, used without HTTP using some other protocol. But for today, let's stick with the HTTP. Word of warning, this is a critical review. This is based on what I learned, what I've seen with my clients, what I've seen with my friends, what I learned uh, running APIs, REST or GraphQL APIs in production. And with that, let's look a little bit at the reviews up to date. There are many of these articles about what is REST, what is GraphQL, how they differentiate. And many of them are saying something along the lines, rest in peace REST, you know, hooray, uh, GraphQL. But if you look not that you know, long ago in the past, there were similar articles just with the, you know, different words in the headlines. It was a REST and SOAP, and it was pretty much the REST was the same. People were angry about uh, web services, and they were hoping that REST will solve all the problems, right? Um, I really like this one, which uh, says uh, REST is the new SOAP, right? So then GraphQL is the new REST, if you want to think about it like that. The bottom line is there are unhappy people with the current or predominant styles, and they have some problems. They, those problems were not heard by REST providers or SOAP web services providers. So the history is repeating, and we are at an, yet another iteration of it. What I would like to stress, though, is that this community is still relatively small. I would like to rather see what, you know, think of us as an API community, not as a GraphQL community or REST API community. We are you know, one community, and we should work together to deliver uh, you know, good technology to the mankind. But you came for a blood, right? So you want to know which one, which one is the best. So let's, let's, let's look at it. Uh, as, as you would probably expect, I'm not going to give you the answer. Uh, however, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to give you the framework so you make, can make the answer for yourself based on your specific environment. Uh, so I said architectural style. What is an architectural style? An architectural style is a set of constraints uh, which, upon applying, will imply a system with certain properties. Let me explain. For example, a decoupling constraint. So a constraint where you say the components in my system, they have to be decoupled. Client has to be decoupled from the server. That implies, if that, that constraint holds, that you can uh, independently evolve client or the server, right? I had a constraint, decoupling implies independent evolution of the both components. Similarly, stateless. If I have a constraint that requires 
you know, my communication is stateless, the state is not stored at the server. That simply implies uh, reliability, scalability, because I can repeat the call idempotency, I can make the many calls, as many calls as I want, because uh, the, the, the requests are idempotent, and also enables me to scale. It might be a little bit more you know, contrived or complicated with, uh, with these constraints. For example, uniform, interf in uniform interface might imply uh, degraded efficiency because you are building interface on top of something, right? So it adds extra milliseconds in the processing. However, it also implies uh, simplicity because you have the same interface to different components in that system. So constraints, properties, this is the main you know, topic for today. If you are an API architect, so somebody looking at this architectural style, your main role is to understand these styles, these paradigms, API paradigms, and to be able to pick uh, the right one for a given task. So the question really is not which one is the best, but which one is the best for a given task. So to give you the answer, I would, of course, need to know the task. Now, before we move forward into constraints and properties, let's talk about these paradigms that we have today. So I think these are some five API paradigms that every architect, every aspiring person who is building API should understand more or less at the minimum. So we have a web APIs. This is uh, represented by REST. Uh, query APIs. Now, this is represented by mainly GraphQL. Uh, flat file, that's also an API, sharing a file with somebody. I'll get to that. Streaming APIs and RPC APIs, like gRPC API. What I noted, what I noticed over the time is that there were actually waves of these you know, API paradigms being used. First, when we started with APIs 2000-ish, uh, we had these point-to-point integrations, one-to-one. -one. There were specific uh, integrations for specific partners or specific customers, usually of a large enterprise. And as, as you know, the popularity grew, we started you know, hitting the ESBs problems and all that web services, and then, then we got a lot of angry front-end developers, and uh, then we got the rest or GraphQL. This is the generic APIs. This is one API provider, one API being consumed by many clients. All right? Now we are slowly getting to the next stage where we will have you know, a client consuming not one API, but probably many API. And many of you are already probably consuming more than one API in your application. Right? So we are slowly getting to the scenario where there will be this many too many uh, uh, you know, API communication, and that's getting really complex, and we need to automate and later make it autonomous. I'll be talking about this later this, uh, this year at the API days in Paris. Uh, however, the main thing is that REST and GraphQL are not the main paradigms these days. If you order, uh, you know, uh, uh, if you make a booking, if you order something and it's fulfilled by a logistic company, if you make a payment, if you buy a you know, flight ticket, the reality is that there is very little REST or GraphQL APIs. It's all running on web services and most often also on the FTPs, EDIs, and things like this. So if you are living in a bubble that uh, REST is you know, the main paradigm today, well, you know, it is not really. However, the choice of the paradigm should be always function of your constraints. So this is going back to the constraints I've been talking about. And this is probably the most important slide of this talk. So uh, I'll be talking about the colonial architecture, in these uh, colonial homes. You know, back when, uh, when the colonists, early colonists in the 18th century were colonizing America, and they were building these, these kind of buildings. And they were in an environment where they have a lot of constraints around them. They didn't have the technology. They, they were like facing bad weather, right? They couldn't build a big glass window. They would probably like to have that one big piece of glass, right? But simply they were constrained by the technology they had. And even if they would be able to create a big panel of a glass, they would probably break it, you know, transporting it on a horse, right? So uh, they were... Similarly for the you know, window shutters, they had to be operational, not decorational, like wooden shutters that will close, the, the roof had to be steep, and all that. They were building colonial homes because they were colonists, and they had colonial constraints. They were not like, hmm, I really like these colonial homes, I think I'm going to build one, right? Well, 
guess what, what we are doing today? I really like REST APIs or GraphQL APIs and think I'm going to build one, right? That's probably not what we want to be doing. We have some constraints around us that we have to listen to. So what are these constraints? First, I, I think about like four areas of the constraints. So first, the business constraints. This is when you think about your product, what your product is, what it has to fulfill, what are the tasks? Is it like for, for uh, you know, the straight show or is it supposed to be around for 20 years? Uh, you know, what are the use cases, business requirements, and also customer-related requirements? Uh, if your customers, all they know, they can process a CSV file, well, good luck convincing them consuming GraphQL, right? Like, you can try. You can try to educate them and you either lose the customers or maybe you will be successful, right? It's, it's up to your decision. But if they don't understand REST or HTTP or GraphQL, then you might have a hard time to, you know, moving them to that. So that, that also constrains you in what you can do. Next, complexity constraints. So how complex uh, is to do something in that API? How, you know, there are different, different types of a complexity related to this task structure, structure, related to the size, how many components you have in your system. If you have a lot of clients making a lot of calls, you are pro probably facing some size-related complexity issues. What is the cognitive algorithmic com uh, complexity? How hard it is to understand the, the, you know, uh, the algorithms in that system? So these imply another properties. These are another constraints. Then there are domain-specific constraints, so constraints of your domain, where you are, uh, what might be some you know, government or business regulations. So those might also imply some properties. And finally, my favorite, uh, cultural constraints. And here is this Conway law, right, which is an amazing rule, which basically says that you are uh, destined as an organization to create systems that are just copies or that are mimicking your communication patterns. If you have two teams in one organization that don't talk to each other, and both of these teams are building some APIs, chances are they are using different paradigms, they are implementing you know, the same, same things over and over, but a little bit differently, and it will be hard for you, you know, to make some use of these, these uh, APIs. But that's just uh, reflecting the reality within the company, with, between the, you know, the communication, or lack of communication between the teams. There are other cultural constraints like the knowledge. Simply, if you don't have a knowledge, if you don't understand REST, how can you build the REST APIs? Not understanding REST constrains you to, build, to not build REST APIs, right? Uh, human resources, peer pressure, trendiness, all these uh, constraints are coming here. What is important, these constraints are implying some properties of a distributed system, of the product that you are building. So uh, it's not just a distributed system, but actually there is a broader ecosystem around it. I will get to that in a, in a few. So what are these properties? So we had these constraints. Now on the other side, if you apply certain constraints, you might get some properties. So let's go through some of the properties of a distributed system of the product that you might be getting based on what constraints you will select. First, the performance. There are at least three ways to think about the performance. There is a actual network performance, there is a network efficiency, and there is a how user perceives the performance, right? Scalability, this has to do with the complexity and the size. How my system scales well or not well with many components in it, many clients making the calls. Simplicity, another tricky property, because it, you, you might not be saying, I'm just, I'm just, I just want the simplicity. I had to ask you, like, what kind of simplicity you want? What, what do you want to be simple in your API product, in your API space? Modifiability, evolvability, how easy or not is to evolve the system, to make a change in the system. You know, some APIs might need these properties, some APIs might need other properties, right? Visibility, this is how, you, how, how well you can see in between the communication between the different components. So this visibility gives us the possibility to, uh, let's say, put an API gateway, a reverse proxy in between two components. So it can you know, do some security things, debugging, etc., caching, of course. Portability, moving uh, your code with the data, deploying in different environments, reliability. 
these are some properties. And actually, those properties I just blast through, those are promised to be induced by uh, uh, REST architectural style. There are other properties that are relevant these days that are not necessarily covered by REST, uh, like discoverability, how easy it is to discover uh, the actions available in the API, but not only the action within the API, but how can you find that API? How can you navigate the API landscape? Uh, type safety, ease of development, those are some of the properties that you might want to be interested in or you might not care, depends. And uh, of course, the cost efficiency. There is this ecosystem around the system that you are building, which you might be interested in and its properties. How active the community is, how good is the tooling, what is the maturity of the whole ecosystem and the systems, actually. And including the resources, uh, articles, books, presentation, onboarding, and tutorials. And last but not least, how uh, ready it is for, for a deployment in the enterprise. So these are some of the properties I care about, generally. Not for every API. If you come to me and say, hey, I want to build product for this and this, I might not need all these properties, right, to deliver that product. These properties are too broad to be needed by every API. Chances are, if you are building an API that is here for you know uh, next few weeks only, uh, then you don't need uh, evolvability. You don't need to modify it, right? Your constraints will result in different properties. So you always have to think about what is constraining me in what I'm doing. What is my team capable of? If I have you know only Java developers using certain framework, am I going to? teach them something different or, or you know, do it in that framework and make it quick. What is more important to me, time to market or you know, using, benefiting from some other uh, properties of the system? But you have to pick uh, based on your choice. Regardless, I'm trying to now go and do the critical review, look at these architectural styles based on you know, what properties you are getting in general if you employ these. So first, rest. It's super hard to uh, get started with REST. If you don't know what REST is, and it's year 2018, there's maybe too many resources or maybe too few resources that are concisely you know, talking about what REST is. Uh, there are some groups that are trying to fix it. API Academy here is having nice tutorials. Uh, but still, I would argue that REST is hard to learn and even harder to master. It took me a long, long time to, to, to get it uh, at least you know, somewhat right. And these APIs are rare to find. They are super, super hard to find outside of World Wide Web, because World Wide Web is the, the biggest and the most successful implementation of a REST API. However, if you pull the REST API correctly, you will get scalability and ability to evolve and discoverability like no other architectural style. And you can tell this, this is proven by World Wide Web, right? So here you have the original listing of constraints that comes with this architectural style we call REST. I'm not going to read through them. The promise is, if you follow these constraints, you will get those properties of the distributed system on the right hand. That's the promise. And that's all that REST is. It doesn't give you anything else. It doesn't give you framework. It doesn't give you formats, anything. It just tells you these constraints you follow, you will get that. So REST comes with benefits. As I said, it scales indefinitely, at least to our knowledge so far. Uh, it's quite performant, especially uh, if you use HTTP2 protocol. Um, it's proven for decades. It works with any representation, with any media type, that, which is also nice. And uh, it's affordance-centric, so it has a high um, design maturity, because REST API is designed around the actions that you can take there. And uh, it's driven by the application state and allows for this evolution over the time. It comes with cost, hard to learn. It is a big paradigm shift in an environment when you have a web services. It's, it's harder to explain uh, you know, web services moving to, to REST. It's a quite big mental uh, step. Um, it requires the clients to play along, which is also one of the sort of drawbacks. And it has arguably not so good to link and uh, challenging to do some governance with REST. Then we have 
this main group, what I call so-called REST APIs. So now if you were like asking, like, what, what are you talking about? There is a lot of REST APIs. Well, the truth is there is very few of them. The rest I call so-called REST APIs. There were, like, let's not go there. Uh, it's the most common style of APIs that we have these days. And usually these APIs are following the HTTP constraints. So what you're getting from HTTP protocol, if you follow the HTTP protocol, you get those constraints, therefore those benefits. However, not all the APIs are even following the HTTP protocol. So things like you know, using proper verbs, uh, concern separation, metadata, data, et cetera, these are the things that I'm talking about. And, uh, and there are actually uh, very nice described in Amundsen's and Richardson maturity models. Um, These so-called APIs still require quite extensive understanding of uh, HTTP to be pulled off properly, and they give you scalability. So these are the original constraints from REST, but these APIs usually do not come with the uh, subdescriptive messages and uh, HTOS, which stands for hypermedia, which implies that you are not getting those properties. You are not getting the simplicity of the uniform interface, and you, you, know, you, are, getting, uh, you are not getting the modifiability. In other words, it's super hard to evolve these APIs. If you were ever thinking about versioning and all this, if you were at the conference listening to some versioning talk, this was because you did not follow all these constraints, you were not getting modifiability. So I already went through this. Uh, so again, it might be still quite performant, uh, but it needs some, some uh, learning too, especially on the HTTP protocol level. And they are pretty much impossible to ev develop, uh, sorry, evolve over the time. All right, so GraphQL APIs. Again, GraphQL is language and framework, a lot of nice libraries and tooling, and this is making it more specific, much more specific than REST. And then a wise man said that the more specific you make something, uh, you know, the likely it will be accepted or allowed by people. This is what we are actually seeing here, and for good. GraphQL is super easy to get started with. It is essentially remote data access. It's thing that we've seen before. It's like SQL over, you know, over a distributed network, but it's better, it's vendor agnostic so far, and uh, it's quite simplified, of course, to SQL. But it's good, because it can offer unparalleled onboarding, developer experience, and time to market. It's blowing two things, a few things away, uh, because it's tunneling through post, usually, uh, and it, right now, has a lot of backshedding, so things that were already invented for the other architectural styles, you, they, they need to be reinvented here. That might and hopefully will eventually happen, but right now, if you jump into that, you won't be getting things like you know, uh, detailed authorization, authentication, content negotiation, things like these. Uh, you have to basically reinvent on your own. And there also are scalability issues because GraphQL is not supporting or taking the advantage of the caches that we have for the internet and World Wide Web. So again, it comes with benefits. User experience, time to market, really, really nice things. I, I love to work with GraphQL APIs. But it's also amazing. It's naturally contract driven. With REST or so-called REST APIs, we are advocating, please, Please start with the contract first, write the API description first before the development with GraphQL, you have to do it. So that's very nice. But again, it comes with some costs. The client server are coupled together, hard to develop, uh, evolve independently. A lot of bike shitting problems with scaling. Um, I tried to put this uh, in the, into a big uh, table, which is a lot of columns, so it didn't, didn't fit here. I'm going to share it. Uh, I would love to hear you know, your comments and thoughts and maybe you know, what, what, is, what, is, uh, what you think should be differently. But this is like a scoring table on different, different of these properties comparing these styles. I'm going to post it uh, later on, on my Twitter. One other thing I want to mention, there is no escaping to API design. With REST, you have to think upfront about the use cases for what you are designing. You have to understand what people want to do with your API design. With GraphQL, you seemingly don't have to do it. You just basically provide the generic access to a data set and everybody will pick up what they want, right? Well, the reality is that that's not so true because uh, then, you have to, then somebody starts to make really, with GraphQL, somebody starts to make really complicated queries 
blowing your system or making it really slow or you know uh, ser servers will be in flames. So you have to start optimizing for queries, not allow certain queries, things like this. So you have to, at the end of the day, understand what are the actually user doings or what they want to do. The difference is with REST, you have to do it first to have a good design. With GraphQL, you can defer it to later, but you will still have to uh, sort of think about it. So there is no escaping to, to you know, design. A good API is uh, you know, understanding the use cases of, uh, of the users. So you have to make a design choices. So I would like to finish with a few examples. And this is my favorite. Um, in one company, we were too successful with our API evangelism. We made a, even HR team coming to us and say, like, hey, we heard there are these uh, APIs. We want to have a REST API, right? Let's build one. So OK, okay. so we started. And, uh, and uh, we designed a very nice REST API. And then I was asking more and more, pushing to the use cases. And we fig figured out that basically what they wanted to do, they had this external uh, payroll processing vendor company, right? And what they wanted to do is really to just once a month give them all the employees' records. They will batch process it, and they do something with the payrolls, right? This is a super bad example for real-time APIs. You probably want to just hand them that big fat file and, you know, every, every once a month, right? So, all that I'm saying is that still sharing a file might be a viable option. It depends on what is the use case, and you have to think about it. Like, it doesn't make sense to make a REST API. A good case for a GraphQL API, though, is when you, talk, when you are talking to yourself. I really like uh, you know, uh, what GatsbyJS is doing, uh, which is a static site generator, but it still really gives you very nice access to the, the static uh, data. Uh, via uh, a GraphQL API. And if you don't need the caching there, then this is just amazing. Where I would say you want to use REST is uh, what we are doing at Adidas. We had a lot of APIs there. Uh, let's say there is a product API, and uh, you learn about, you know, what, about your shoe, what are the information about that particular product. But then you want to link into other API and figure out what is the availability in the inventory, B2C, B2B inventory. How does it relate to you know, reference data API? So if you, have a, if you are having this API landscape where you have multiple APIs, then I think REST is actually a very, very good choice because you can link between the APIs and you know, follow the links from how oh, this is a product what's the availability, et cetera, et cetera. And also, I think the REST, in general, is a very good thing for uh, microservices, because you know, those are naturally bounded contexts, and you are navigating and mapping between those. So conclusion, use REST if you want to build a system that lasts, if you need a content negotiation, if you want to some precise authorization, authentication, rate limiting. Uh, or interlink APIs together, or use mixed media types, or care about scaling. If you are building a system where there will be a lot of components, then please use REST. Use GraphQL if you are talking to yourself, backend, frontend scenarios, that's, that's a very good one. Uh, use it instead of so-called REST, please. Don't do that anymore. We luckily now have GraphQL, uh, short-term projects, uh, uncertain use cases when you need to uh, iterate on, the, on your product and you, you need to figure out what actually is that the user wants. Uh, or just you want to provide the data access without the need for infrastructure caching. Or value wallet use case is amazing developer experience with very little effort. Um, don't do this. Don't build the so-called REST APIs. But always pick based on your constraints, not somebody else's, because you are unique. Thank you. All right. That was uh, excellent, Z. Don't go too far, because we've got five minutes. So I could actually take a moment to ask the audience for questions. Sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, we got some. Super. Hey, Z. Hey, Ted. I um, wanted to ask about contracts, because you, mm -hmm. you said that uh, contract is a natural part of the GraphQL mm -hmm. design paradigm. Can you explain that a little bit? Absolutely. Thank you. So the contract is being, uh, uh, like, or how I define it, the description of an API, what the API, it's a map for the API, and GraphQL 
you have to have it because uh, that's a GraphQL schema. It, uh, it says what the API offers, what are the actions, what are maybe the mutations, or potentially what queries you might uh, take, and what are the data. So contract here means, and that applies both to API, uh, GraphQL and REST APIs, a contract is uh, uh, basically API description, Swagger for REST APIs or, or GraphQL schema for GraphQL APIs. And once you define that, hopefully at the start of development and with GraphQL, you have to do it, that's the beauty of it, at the start of the development or before the development, then it should be binding the parties uh, in that API lifecycle. So clients know what they can expect once the things is implemented. Stakeholders know what, the, what, what is being implemented. It can be tested or it's driven. This, this, the concept of contract works in both worlds, but with GraphQL, you absolutely have to have it. There is no GraphQL API without GraphQL schema. Yeah. So the graph protocol is the contract in a way. Yeah. GraphQL schema is the contract. Once, once it's approved, like, Swagger is a contract. If it's approved, you know, you write the Swagger, write the GraphQL. People look at it, say, hey, this is what we want to consume, what we want to build. Yes, let's do it. That, that moment, it becomes the contract. Cool. Thank you. Sure. All right. Great question. I think we have time for one more. Any takers? Yep. Way over there. <laughs> so, so really, just think about the constraints of the environment you're in and what properties you want to get. So I have a question about linking. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a bit of a challenge sometimes when you have like distributed microservices uh -huh. that aren't really supposed to know about each other. Uh -huh. Do you have a Strategy. Yeah, so, uh, well, strategy. Uh, so first, there has to be a will, like understanding that if I have this, uh, let's use this Adidas example, product API with the information about the article shoes, then you have another API which might have information about that, that product uh, availability, right? Uh, normally, you would have to know ID of this uh, article in this API, I put it in some you know request in that other API, and I'll get the availability. What I'm arguing here with the REST APIs, you can link from this product API to this uh, to this um, uh, inventory API, and there has to be with microservices this uh, microservice discovery. The URL has to be of course uh, resolved, and uh, it has to be a known host. So it, it depends. There are there are some you know microservices uh, discovery tools that can help you with that. But first, it starts with really this determination that you want to link in between the APIs, and this is what made actually web and Google possible because web pages were linking not within the site but through the different sites. All right, super. Uh, Z, even without a co-presenter, well done. Thank you. Let's give one more <laughs> round of applause. Thank you.